Yes, good. All right, so thank you, uh, Shil, and uh, I'll be telling you about generalizations of Hodge Durham degeneration for Fukaya categories. And uh, I wanted to first thank the organizers for giving uh, me an opportunity to speak at the seminar. I feel very lucky to do that. And in particular, I wanted to thank Shiel for uh, his work on cyclic open closed maps because this work ends up, uh, you know, actually using that in a pretty nice way. Um, so, all right, with that, uh, you should, should feel free to ask questions. Um, and with that, I will begin. So, um, my website is on this first slide if you end up wanting to take a look at it. Um, so here's what the outline of the talk is going to be. So before I can tell you about, you know, generalizations of hodge durham degeneration for categories, I should first remind you what hodge durham degeneration is. So this is some fact in classical Hodge theory of algebraic varieties, which has both an analytic component, a Hodge theory, and an algebraic component, namely something about algebraic Durham cohomology. So then I'll tell you about non-commutative Hodge theory, or just the very basics of that, which is uh, a program to try to understand what part of the Hodge theory of a variety uh, is known by its DG category of coherent sheaves. Um, and uh, this particular uh, set of ideas has a lot of relevance to mirror symmetry um, because mirror symmetry wants to relate Hodge theory of a variety with some kind of symplectic topology on its mirror. Um, so in particular, there's a seminal result um, which you'll understand the statement of by the time we get there, that the non-commutative hodge durham spectral sequence degenerates for smooth proper categories. That's a result of collating in characteristic zero. Now, uh, then I'll talk about uh, some conjectures of Kinsevich about what is supposed to happen for smooth or just proper DG categories. And it turns out that those conjectures are false by some explicit counterexamples due to Efimov. Um, and then finally, I'll tell you why they're true for DG categories coming out of symplectic geometry. Uh, and the arguments that you use to do this lend a TQFT interpretation to these conjectures and sort of clarify what they mean and to some degree help you give you, give you a conceptual reason for um, why, why they shouldn't have, why they, why they were wrong in the end. Um, so that's the goal. So, all right, so let's begin with classical Hodge theory. So if you have um, a complex projective manifold X, then it has some you know, singular cohomology groups or topological ones. That I'm gonna call this sometimes Betty cohomology. And this has a decomposition into um, you know, subgroups, the Hodge cohomology groups. So I'm not sure if Hodge really thought about this this way, um, but this is what we think of now. Uh, and I guess the HPQ group, group is the harmonic, you know, P complex linear Q complex anti-linear complex value differential forms on X. Um, and so both of these invariants are kind of analytic. One uses, you know, topology and the other one uses a metric on X. Um, but in fact, you know, you can also compute the cohomology of X using a more algebraic method called algebraic Durham cohomology. And algebraic Durham cohomology is just what happens when you take the complex of, you know, holomorphic differential forms on X or sheaves of holomorphic, the, the complex of sheaves of holomorphic differential forms or alternatively the algebraic differential forms if instead of a complex projective manifold, you have a variety of a field. And then you take the hyper cohomology of this complex. And so it's growth and Deke's idea that this actually computes singular cohomology. Okay, so if you filter, you know, if you have a complex and you take its hyper cohomology, well, if you, if you filter the complex, you're gonna get a spectral sequence converging from the homology of the subquotients to the homology, the hyper cohomology of the complex. So the homology of the subquotients is clearly just the homology of these sheaves. This is Dobell cohomology. And well, by Hodge theory, the Dobell cohomology is the same as the Hodge cohomology. 
which decomposes the Duran cohomology into pieces. So the spectral sequence can't have any differentials and it has to degenerate at the first page. So this spectral sequence is called the hodge duran spectral sequence. And one reason why it's important is because it's really kind of an object in algebraic geometry uh, rather than in analysis because this complex of sheaves sort of makes sense on, on any smooth variety of any variety. And what you get from the, just the existence of a, this, um, uh, this existence of this complex of sheaves is some filtration on Duran cohomology, which Hodge theory shows is isomorphic to this um, sum of uh, Hodge groups. Uh, and so, you know, some elementary linear algebra then shows that you can recover the Hodge groups from this Hodge filtration together with the action of complex conjugation. Um, now, the important point here is that the filtration is algebraic. It makes sense on like any variety, even on a over a field of characteristic zero, but complex conjugation is really a not an algebraic operation. So there's this wonderful example that I like to kind of tell people about of Francois Charles, which, which is the first person from whom I took an algebraic geometry class. So that there are two, um, there exists two, you know, smooth projective varieties over the complex numbers where they're defined by the same equations, but in one of them, you just apply a complex automorphism of the complex numbers to the coefficients to get the other. And they have different real cohomology rings. Um, so sort of the strongest possible statement that you might have, complex conjugation really is, is sort of really uses the, your model of the complex numbers as, you know, the plane and not as just an abstract field. Of course, their complex cohomology rings are isomorphic as rings by, you know, the existence of algebraic Duran theory. All right. And so, um, so I said that, you know, this Hodge decomposition of cohomology, you know, you might think it needs a metric, but actually uh, this, the, all you need is you need complex conjugation and the spectral sequence. And the spectral sequence is something that does not need a metric to be defined. So actually the Hodge decomposition of cohomology is independent of the metric. Um, and the fact that the subquotients of uh, the, this Hodge filtration are always devote cohomology is a theorem of Delino Z, which has a purely algebraic proof. So that's something that's true, not just for complex projective manifolds, but for any smooth proper variety over a field of characteristic zero. And um, so star here is, indicates this spectral sequence. And um, this is proven using you know, entirely algebraic methods, reduction to characteristic P and so on. Okay. So that's my review of Hodge theory. So now, um, you know, for going forward from Hodge's time or Deline's time to the 90s, you know, mirror symmetry was a, something that happened. Um, so there was the, the, all, all these expectations that if you have some algebraic variety X, then it should be mirrored to some symplectic manifold X check. Um, Okay, so maybe there are a lot of expectations about how mirror symmetry should work. Maybe it should be a duality on Kalavi-Yau threefolds. Maybe there should be an equivalence of quantum field theories. Maybe, uh, you know, there's a lot of expectations. It's an idea that came from physics. Um, but one thing that, you know, two, two parts of the story is that one idea is that the variation of Hodge structure of X So this is like the differential equations describing how the Hodge decomposition of X varies as you vary X. This should be related to the germ witten theory of X check. And also that the category of coherent sheaves on X should be related to and equivalent presumably to the Fukaya category of X check or a derived variant. Okay, so this top thing is sometimes called, you know, enumerative mirror symmetry. And this bottom thing is sometimes called homological mirror symmetry. And a question that many people are interested in and there's sort of lots of progress on is whether homological mirror symmetry should imply enumerative mirror symmetry. And to do that, you have to understand what part of Hodge theory is you know, known by the category of coherent sheaves in a variety. And then you can hope to transpose that to the symplectic side and understand it. So. Um, now there's very, you know, the degree to which we don't know the answer to this question, how much the Hodge theory of X is contained in the derived category of X, is uh, sort of elucidated by a very, by, by very controversial conjecture of Orlov, which is that derived equivalent smooth projective varieties over C should have the same Hodge numbers. So 
Uh, every time I talk to an algebraic geometer about this, they're certain that this must be false. Um, but I hope, I'm hoping that someone uh, finds a counterexample because um, it would, it's a fact that would be too nice if it was true, but not provable. Okay. So a much easier thing to do than to really understand how much of the Hodge theory of a variety is uh, known by its category of sheaves is the subject of non-commutative Hodge theory. So this goes through Hochschild homology. So um, the Hochschild homology of a variety X, uh, well, one way to define it is as the endomorphisms of the structure sheaf of the diagonal inside the derived category of the product. Um, and so it's a, you know, there's some kind of, if the variety is smooth and proper, um, well, it's it just even if it's smooth, and there's some kind of causal resolution of the diagonal that you can write down. Um, and so it's a theorem of Swan, which builds on work of Hochschild, Constant, and Rosenberg, and often this, all the, every result of this kind is called the Hochschild, Constant, Rosenberg theorem, although, of course, many people proved parts of it. Um, is that uh, the- Someone, endomorph there's a question from Paul Seibel. Paul? Yes. The derived tensor product of the diagonal with itself. Yes, I'm sorry. So that's sorry. homology. I wrote the wrong thing. Sorry about that. I wrote down something for Hochschild cohomology. You're right. Gosh. Hmm. Okay. So that's true. And then I suppose if you look at um, endomorphisms, that gives you Hochschild cohomology. That's right. Okay, um, so there's a Calabi-Yau property which relates Hochschild homology and Hochschild cohomology. Sometimes um, that's an important thing to keep in mind. All right. Okay, that's correct. And so um, if you let A be the derived category of sheaves on X, of the derived category of X, then there's this bimodule over A, the diagonal bimodule. And you can take its tensor product with itself in the category of A, A out bimodules. And that's going to be the same thing as Hochschild homology. And I'm going to denote the kind of chain level representative of this, of this by the Hochschild chains on X. Okay, great. Um, so now there's an important observation due to Khan. Did I answer that question? Where is the N? Okay, good. Uh, so now there's an important observation due to Khan that uh, the chains on the circle act on Hochschild homology. Uh, so there's a circle action and uh, so if you look at, you know, the circle is a group, and so chains on it are an algebra. And if you ask, you know, you can write a model for this chains on the circle just using the CW decomposition of the circle into a point and an interval as just K adjoined lambda modulo lambda squared equals zero. And so there's an action of this algebra on Hochschild chains if you use specific model for this derived tensor product, which comes right down, so there's an action Um, and this is called the B operator sometimes, uh, con B operator, con operator. And under this uh, kind of isomorphism to differential forms on X, so Hochschild, Constant, Rosenberg prove this kind of isomorphism when X is affine. Um, this ends up corresponding to the action of D on the Durham complex of the Durham differential. All right, so something I'm gonna use, I guess, is that um, the kind of categories are clavi and so you know, identify Hochschild homology and Hochschild cohomology. Um, that's going to be important. All right, so um, we can form uh, negative, from this data of this operator and this chain complex, we can form some auxiliary complexes. So one of them is the negative cyclic homology of this category A, um, and the other one is the periodic cyclic homology of this category. So this is the negative cyclic homology. Uh, 
And uh, so what you do is you just sort of tensor by a formal power series ring, or you complete with respect to this variable u. Uh, you, the variable u is of degree two, and you deform the differential by the action of the con operator. Um, and then what you can do, well, so this is some kind of, you know, this is some kind of S1 equivariant version of Hochschild homology. And so what you do when you have an action of S1, you build some S1 equivariant complexes, and then you can invert the equivariant parameter. So that gives you some kind of Tate version of the S1 equivariant homology. That's called periodic cyclic homology. And then um, if you uh, look at, uh, there's a theorem. I mean, I guess originally this was Kahn's idea. He proved it wasn't for DG categories. It was for you know smooth algebras of smooth functions. But it turns out that if A is the derived category of X and X is smooth, I think then this is the same as the Durham cohomology of X well, that's been made too periodic. Um, so the idea is the periodic cyclic homology um, is sort of directly analogous to the hypercohomology of the Durham complex. Because what we did is, well, if we kind of ignore this con operator part that's just the you know we've that's just the differential forms and then we've added on a new differential um, but you know because we had to add in this variable of degree two it ends up sort of mixing things up okay so if you filter the periodic cyclic homology by powers of u you get a spectral sequence starting from you know two periodic version of Hochschild homology and converging to periodic cyclic homology and this is called the non-commutative hodge durham spectral sequence okay so now it's an important theorem of Kaladin that this spectral sequence above degenerates whenever your category, okay, so I wrote X here, that's meant to be A, because um, this spectral sequence makes sense, you know, quite a lot of generality. There we go. Okay. So this spectral sequence degenerates um, by result of Kaladin whenever A is a smooth proper DG category over a field of characteristic zero. So this is, some kind of non-commutative analog of the Deline Ilzi result, um, because, well, I'll tell you what a smooth and proper category are, but um, you know, it uh, it's sort of the, the version of this where if you believe smooth proper categories like smooth proper manifolds, this is what you'd expect to be true. Okay, so let me tell you what um, these words are. So you say that a DG category A is smooth if A is perfect as an AA bimodule. In other words, if you take like projective AA bimodules, you can build A out of a cone, out of an iterated cone of such things. Um, and so, you know, there's sort of, because, well, if you can resolve the diagonal by vector bundles and you can resolve anything by vector bundles, um, it ends up, it ends up being true that in the case where A is the derived category of X, well, if X is smooth, that happens exactly when the derived category of X is smooth. And likewise, um, there's a definition of a proper category, which is just when it's cohomologically finite dimensional. So the sum of the dimensions of the cohomology the HOM groups after you take cohomology are finite for any pair of objects. Um, and sort of if, if A is the derived category of a variety, well, if X, X then if X is, is proper, that happens whenever DFX is proper. Okay, so algebraic geometry is one source of very rich DG categories. Another source of them is symplectic geometry. And so I'm gonna, uh, say some words here. So, you know, we're going to, so X check here is supposed to be a symplectic manifold, and we're going to say it's uh, non-degenerate if it satisfies this, uh, you know, this Abuzai generation criterion. So there's some kind of map, open closed, from Hochschild homology of the Fukaya category, X check, to some version of symplectic homology of X check, and we're going to say um, it's not degenerate whenever the unit is in the image. And it turns out that um, implies smoothness of this category. And okay, so properness, you know, the geometric conditions that correspond to properness, there's all kinds of natural things you might say. Well, 
you know, you could just consider only compact Lagrangians, and then these things are going to be homologically finite dimensional. Or you can, um, you know, if you're going to do some version of the wrap Fukaya category, you just need to make sure there's the wrapping is sort of fully stopped. So, like in the Fukaya category of elections vibration. Okay. So now, in Hodge theory, you know, we in the algebraic context, if you had um, an algebraic variety over C, then you could show that this Hodge Durham spectral sequence degenerates for analytic reasons by, you know, the use of harmonic forms. So you might ask if Fukaya categories have a similar property, if the non commutative Hodge Durham spectral sequence for a Fukaya category that's smooth and proper for kind of geometric reasons degenerates because of analysis. And the answer is yes. So this is uh, due to Ganatra. Um, and the idea is that, well, if you want to prove it, that this, not, this spectral sequence degenerates, that you can do by trivializing the S1 action on Hochschild homology. So you need to find another complex quasi-isomorphic to this one, to your starting complex equivariantly. In the second complex, the action is trivial. Um, and so what you do is there's this open closed map I mentioned from the Hochschild homology to the symplectic homology. And if your thing is non-degenerate, then this is an isomorphism. And then um, in the case where you're working on a compact manifold or you're only considering compact Lagrangians, you can choose this map to go to a version of symplectic homology, which is, um, you know, for which the, man the which is some kind of topological cohomology group of the underlying manifold. So maybe it's relative, some version of relative cohomology. Um, in any case, um, on that latter thing, the S1 action is trivial because sort of, um, it, yeah, it just ends up being easy to check that if you have so kind of you can choose write down a Morse function computing these things with the generators are all constant orbits um, of the, the Hamiltonian defined by the Morse function. Um, and so an important remark is that these analytic methods actually prove more than the algebraic results. So Clayton ends up sort of showing that there this there is this filtration, but well, there's this filtration on periodic cyclic homology, and it has a splitting. In other words, there kind of exists a trivialization of this S1 action. But you haven't chosen which trivialization. Um, but if you actually write down a map to a complex on which this S1 action is manifestly trivial, that actually gives you a splitting of the filtration on periodic cyclic homology. So there's actually more data that you get from analysis. And so one reason this is important is for this project about um, recovering uh, non, uh, recovering, you know. Gormer Witten variants or Hodge or numerative mirror symmetry from homological mirror symmetry. So if you have a, there's a result of Costello that can be said something like if you have a smooth proper DG category equipped with the trivialization of the S1 action on Hochschild homology, then you can define some kind of categorical Gormer Witten variants. So you can, there's some numbers you can extract. Um, and it's hard to compute these numbers, but people have been able to do it. So there's a much more recent work of Calderaro and two, where they explicitly compute the G equals one, N equals Gram, Gram, Gram Witten variants from the derived category of an elliptic curve. And those end up agreeing with uh, using the trivialization coming from Hodge theory, which is, ex which is extra data. Um, and those end up agreeing with the Gram Witten variants of the mirror elliptic curve. And what's the idea of like why this S1 action is important? Well, Hochschild homology is an action of something called the you know, framed E2 operad, or at least it's homology operad. So that's something like you have disks and they have marked points of inputs and outputs, and they have marked points on the ends, and you compose them by gluing them by having the points aligned. And you know, if you there's this S1, well, that's the one where you sort of you take this marked point and then you rotate it. And if you trivialize it, then that's sort of the same as being able to glue on a cap in a cap, there's no, there's no actual clear asymptotic direction. And so um, if you take this S1 and then you kill it uh, homotopically, then you end up getting the genus zero to the Mumford operad. Um, I think that's formalized by uh, Drummond Cole. If you want to have an actual operatic statement. But on homology, this is sort of the same kind of thing that um, Costello proved. I mean, Costello did higher genus curve for invariance. It's important to mention. Anyway, that's why the S1 action is important. Now you might ask what happens if the category A is just smooth or just proper? Is there any kind of weaker degeneration statements that hold? And so there are some conjectures of Kinsevich about this. Um, so one of them is uh, if the, uh, so one, of, so one of them is one for proper categories and one of them is one for smooth categories. So I'm gonna briefly tell you what these are about. 
So the first one, okay, so I didn't tell you what HC is. HC is a, a cyclic homology, not negative cyclic homology. So that's like the thing I wrote down, but you have um, only negative powers of the U variable and you throw out all the positive powers. Um, and then there's this m map coming from some long exact sequence, delta. Um, so you have an exact sequence like Hochschild to cyclic to cyclic, and there's a boundary map, and that's what this is. It's essentially the same as the action of the B operator. And uh, you're supposed to apply that um, and then compose it with a pairing. So if you have a proper category, then the HOM is a bifunctor to perfect modules over the base field. Uh, and so Hochschild homology of that is just the actual field itself. So this is some kind of pairing that exists in the proper case. And the claim is that the composition should be zero. And um, in the smooth case, so A is supposed to be a smooth category, well, there's some kind of other conjecture. So if you take the diagonal bimodule in here, um, which exists in here because it's perfect, this is the homology of the K theory of the category of perfect complexes, then you apply some kind of Chern character and you apply some kind of cons map and it's supposed to be mapped to zero. So those were the conjectures. So I'm not sure what the motivation is exactly. One motivation might be that these hold in the algebraic context when A comes from a smooth or proper variety. Another motivation might be that these are equivalent to vastly more general conjectures. So FMOP had a series of papers showing that these, you know, if you assume these, you can prove more and more. Um, another one is that, you know, there's all kinds of reasonable conjectures about category theory which might imply this. There's some notion of a categorical compactification, and if A admits a categorical compactification, then it implies the smoothness conjecture, for example. Um, and finally, maybe Kunsevich had some kind of TQFT idea for why these should be true. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll see some TQFT interpretation of what these are about, but also the interpretation might actually show you why it would be very surprising if these were true. Anyway, so I've given the punch this, this part of the punchline away. So Efimov showed that these conjectures are false. And the proof is some kind of explicit counterexample. So I, I wrote something here. Um, so if you, there's a DG algebra with a semi-orthogonal decomposition into two pieces, K adjoined Y mod Y cubed and K adjoined X mod X to the sixth. The gluing is given by a one-dimensional bimodule. So um, you can just compute something and you see that it doesn't satisfy, that these maps don't, um, aren't zero. Um, this is the proper case. And then by some duality implies the smooth case. And, uh, so this is like a matrix of 18 numbers that disproves this conjecture. Okay. Anyway, so here's where I'm going to start talking about my work. Uh, so Efimov showed up at the Columbia Math Department, and you know he uh, uh, was saying all these. He was very excited that he had disproving these conjectures of Kunsevich, which I hadn't heard about and I couldn't understand. Um, but there was some crucial point that the, these conjectures should tell you that if you are, have a proper DG category, then the supertrace of the third Massey product should be zero. So this makes sense because uh, it's finite dimensional, so you can take the trace of an operator on cohomology. And OK, um, it should be zero, but apparently in some, counter, in some example, it's not. Fine. So if you're a FLIR theorist, what do you think when somebody tells you about the supertrace of the third Massey product? Well. For Fukaya categories, uh, the third Massey product it has three inputs and one output. So we're supposed to put A and B on the inputs, some X on the input, and we're supposed to sum over configurations of disks that X is the input and X is the output. Okay, so that's what this is. This is the number of these disks. And now, well, if you have such a disk, you can glue it to itself along X. Okay, and this is going to be the boundary of some moduli space of annuli. Okay, so here's an A and here's B. And now, okay, well, how does this moduli space of annuli degenerate? Well, it can sort of degenerate in one more way where the annular parameter becomes really big. This is A and B. But this is, um, this is like a co-dimension two degeneration. Because, By the way, there's uh, a question from Paul Seidel. Um, Paul, if, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I just uh, just wondering. This is a chain map. X goes to M three, 
AXP? Um, so A and B are co-cycles, is this? Yes. And, uh, okay. There's a formula I'll show later, which is derived okay. by um, okay. after mod. It's on the next, in, in two slides. I, I'm not sure I can derive, write down the formulas right now. Offhand. But yes, A and B are meant to be co-cycles. Um, I mean, they're meant to be Hochschild cycles, in particular, they're just cycles. Um, okay, so there's this other degeneration of this moduli space, and um, it's a co-dimension two module degeneration because, well, there's no constraint on where these endpoints are supposed to lie. So this actually never happens whenever you look at an, one dimensional of these mod. Uh, if this is, you know, index one, then this will never happen. And so that tells you that this moduli space defining the super trace is the boundary of another moduli space. Oh, let me write that more coherently. This moduli space is the boundary of this moduli space, and so this count is zero. So for Fukaya categories, this crucial thing that FML had identified can never happen. Okay, so this moduli space should remind you of another famous moduli space, which is the one that pops up in Muhammad's proof, of Abu Zayed's proof of the generation criterion. So here what you do is you have the same annulus, same inputs, or, um, but you require that they actually lie on the same, uh, like you, you require a constraint on their relative angles. So that's the difference. And then this can degenerate in two ways again. So one of the ways it can degenerate is by the angular parameter becoming large, and it'll degenerate in this way. But here there's a constraint on where these, uh, what the relative angles of these things have to be. So actually, this is a co-dimensional one degeneration. On the other hand, um, if the angular annular parameter becomes small, because you've imposed this constraint, the disk is the annular is actually going to break in two points, not in one. So you got this sort of famous picture. Um, of the other degeneration, other co-dimension one degeneration. And so, you know, in that uh, argument, this shows that some kind of open closed map combined with some closed open map is the same as some kind of co-product com composed with a product. Um, I don't know how to write that. Okay. So something similar is proving these two different statements. All right, so what about the rest of the conjecture? Well, there's some formula. I mean, the way FMOP got to prove these things is he just wrote down formulas for things until he found a counterexample. But, so this is supposed to be, um, you know, this is supposed to be a more general statement for what this map is if um, uh, you have some proper bimodule over A1 and A2. So you should think A1 equals A2, and this is just the massy product. And um, in that case, uh, uh, I mean, the same sort of argument works. You just uh, get this, you know, you have an annulus like this with A's on one side and B's on the other side. And then this can degenerate into exactly this product or exactly the super trace. Um, there's some A's here and some b's here um, or it can degenerate into something of co-dimension two um, or it can have disk bubbles coming off and that ends up giving you the condition that you started with Hochschild cycles Cool. So I have some uh, affinity for this formula because this is the first time I wrote, I saw a complicated A infinity formula and then realized it was actually sort of simple. Um, okay, so that's essentially how you prove the proper case of this conjecture. Um, so what about the smooth case? So can you mention again this, this Hochschild cycle thing you said? Yeah. What, what is that case? Oh, so you have to start with, um, you know, A0 to AN um, 
being us. I mean, this is a formula for this map, but you have to actually input a Hochschild cycle into the whole thing. So this annulus can degenerate by having disk bubbles come off the side, and that ends up being like contribution of the, Hodge, of, of the Hochschild differential. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. So now in the smooth case, it's sort of hard to do the same trick because well, the, this con operator is all about the unit in, the, in uh, your DG category. And the Fukaya category is not unital. You can build homotopy units, you can build cohomological units, um, but it's really quite annoying to write formulas. So I spent a while trying to write formulas, and eventually I realized that a better strategy would be to try to reduce this computation to some kind of computation involving symplectic cohomology, and then hopefully there, um, you know, some simple argument with moduli spaces proves these conjectures. All right, so I'm going to make some technical assumption here, which is that the diagonal bimodule is a complex of Yoneta modules. Um, so here's what the reduction sort of looks like. So you have A is the wrapped Fukaya category, and A op is the Fukaya category that's opposite. We're going to assume both this assumption and some non degeneracy condition. Um, so then the diagonal Lagrangian um, is a class in the K theory of the Fukaya category of the product, and there's some Kunath map. I mean, there's a Kunath map to uh, AA bimodules, AA op bimodules. And um, this induces a map on K theory. This also induces a map on Hochschild homology. And uh, this sends the diagonal Lagrangian to the diagonal bimodule. So then, okay, we're still trying to compare with symplectic homology. So maybe we can there's just try there's to. An, there's, apply another question from, uh, there's another question from um, Paul Seidel. Paul, please go ahead. I'm sorry, I have to figure that I'm holding. conclusion in the proper case? I will state a conclusion in his, yeah. So the conclusion is that if you have a, the, uh, you know, Uville domain with uh, C1 equals zero, so it's called Yao. Uh, I mean, there it doesn't matter, actually. If you have a Uville domain, then the, um, the, um, yeah, if you have a Uville domain, then the, um, the if you look at the category of exact, Lagrangians in the evil domain, the one that you define, um, then this conjecture is true for that category. Okay, awesome. So um, anyway, so there are these Kunith maps, this diagram commutes, and then there are some open closed maps. So on the left hand side, I can apply just the usual open closed map. On the right hand side, I have some category of bi modules, but there's a category, there's an algebraic Kunith map on Hochschild homology, then I can apply the tensor product to open closed maps. So presumably, this diagram should commute. Um, I'm going to write it with a red thing. And then, you know, there's these open closed maps, and then there are these con operators on Hochschild homology and on symplectic homology. And uh, Chilganatra's work on the cyclic extension of the open closed map tells you that there's a, you know, negative cyclic version of symplectic homology, and that uh, this diagram commutes as well. Okay. And uh, in, under the non-degeneracy assumption, well, enough of these errors are isomorphisms. So if I want to show that this is zero, it suffices to show that this is zero. OK. So now, what's this ch zero? I haven't told you about that. Well, that's just the image of the unit in palms from the diagonal to itself. Cool. Um, so that's something simple. Let's write that down. Uh, so you start off with uh, the unit of the diagonal Lagrangian. So this is kind of given by a moduli space like this. Uh, then you need to apply an open closed map. So this is uh, so the open closed map. Then you need to maybe apply some kind of Kunith map, which might be trivial depending on your model of symplectic cohomology. And then you need to apply one tensor, this con operator. So I'm going to denote that by a little dot going around. But of course, this is a picture in m cross m minus. That maps to that. Um, OK, so we can glue. Let's just glue the top part first. So if you just glue the top part, you get a moduli space that looks like this. OK, and this is a maps to m cross n minus. M minus is the opposite symplectic manifold. Um, and for a long time, I was confused. I was just drawing sort of mysterious TQFT pictures. Uh, and eventually, there was this crucial point that, you know, this diagram means something both in M and in M cross M minus, because you can just unfold along the diagonal. 
So this is the same as this picture. And so, okay, let me be a little clearer here. I have to take like some Hamiltonian term to define some symplectic cohomology. So it's H and H. Um, but once you unfold, you have this Hamiltonian term here and kind of minus this Hamiltonian term here. M. And then this, okay, on the right, you have some kind of positive end, but you can think of that as a negative end. And that's the same as the moduli space that would usually define this operation. Okay, great. So now, um, right, sorry, but quick question. The outputs are both cylinders still, right? What? Or the outputs are both still, uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't quite follow the, um, you, you're, you want to end up in Hochschild homology. Ah, not, not symplectic homology. Everything is in symplectic homology. Ah, so then the outputs are both cylindrical. It looked like you're drawing a strip. Yeah, yeah like everything here is yeah, supposed yeah. to be cylindrical. I'm sorry. That's yeah. A, yeah, that's very important. These are all cylinders. Everything is a cylinder. There are no strips anywhere. I've removed yeah. all the strips by Thanks. this big diagram. Absolutely. Thanks. That's the whole point. I mean, the strips are really complicated. Okay, great. So now we have this last moduli space. Can I ask about the diagram once more? Yeah, sure. Uh, the two sides, which direction was? No, the, 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 the drawing, the, the cylinders. What's the difference between the two sides? Are you just looking at them in different directions? Well, the left-hand side is like, I mean, I have a composition of maps. Um, then I glued some of that composition using flare theory to get this um, this uh, character. But this is a map from like a half infinite cylinder to m cross m minus. That's the same as a map from an infinite cylinder to m. Uh, so you think it goes from up, up to down vertically? Okay. What? I mean, this is the output. Uh -huh. So this, this is the composition of maps here. I just okay. glued it. I'm studying the moduli space. Uh -huh. But it's outputting here. This is an output. This is technically a positive end, but it's acting as an output because of this reversal. I see. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, time one orbits of h or inverses of time one orbits of minus h. That's sort of important here. Okay. Is that does that answer your question? Yes. Great. So anyway, we have this moduli space h and h, and now we. Um, Uh, we can just make the sort of perturbation term zero on a larger and larger region in the middle. And then eventually this moduli space would split into a map from a pair of, uh, of diff. Uh, and now, okay, so this was just me studying the first part. I haven't actually applied any con operators yet. So if I want to apply some con operators, well, all you need to use is the fact that if you take sort of something coming out of a disk um, and then you apply uh, this con operator, then this is actually boarding to zero. Um, so, you know, that this is sort of in string topologies, this fact that the BV operator kills constant loops. Ah. So this moduli space ends up having some symmetry and there are just never any, uh, you know, any elements uh, of the moduli space of dimension one, um, or there are never any rigid such configurations. Alternatively, I mean, what you should think about is if you have an action of S1 um, on the constant loops in the free loop space, if you take just a constant loop, then you get a degenerate chain as the image of the action, so that's zero. Um, okay. So that's, uh, yeah, so there's this map to negative cyclic homology, but it's given by the same kinds of moduli spaces that occur in the moduli space for the BD operator. That's where this works. All right, so here's a, here's a statement. So uh, these Kinsevich conjectures are true for the category of closed exact Lagrangians in a Uval domain. Um, and if I want this to be graded, I need it to have C1 equals, you know, zero. And likewise, um, for the rap Fukaya category of uh, non-degenerate Uval domain, um, which also satisfies this assumption that the diagonal bimodule is uh, generated by the Unetta modules. So, for example, if this uh, Eagle domain is actually Weinstein by work of GPS. And again, to have gradings, you need to you know, say something like C equals zero. 
Okay, and there's a draft of this argument on my website, um, but it's only done in characteristic two because there's a lot of signs um, and they take time to write up. All right. Um, great. Do I ever, no, I never actually use the Columbia property. It's just not necessary. Great. I just, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Oh, so some sort of important statement is that, you know, these Konsevich, Efimov's disproof works for Kalabiao categories. Um, I, this is something I talked to him about. So it does not follow algebraically from some like standard property of the Kaya category. So maybe these technicalities, so this assumption I said, this is just because there's this diagram about the, I had with the red arrow about the open closed map commuting with the Kunith map. So that's, uh, uh, there are various ways you could try to prove this, but um, it takes a lot of combinatorics to prove it in general. And I thought it sort of de would detract from the main point of the argument, which is really a pretty simple idea. It's just this series of pictures. Um, so then you know, I have to choose, there were some Kunith maps that popped up. You have to choose a model for that. There are several models. So I use Ganatra's sort of work on this, which uses split Hamiltonians. You know, the split version, the version of the Rafukaya category has been shown to be the same as the non-split version by Gao. And then there's a different Kunith map to find by GPS. Presumably it's the same one. Um, and finally, I don't actually need to pull apart these moduli spaces. I mean, an action argument shows that this already lies in the image of the acceleration map um, uh, if you pick your Hamiltonian terms correctly. So, but this would sort of be a TQFT way of thinking about this problem. Okay, so that's the statement. All right, so now, Let's just step back. What's the, what, what did we do? So in the smooth case, I'm gonna draw a very schematic picture. So we had this moduli space. We have this sort of empty diagonal constraint. And then we composed it with this uh, VV operator here, or this con operator. And then what we did is that this is this, we pulled this apart. And now we use the fact that uh, the con operator kills images of count disks. That was sort of the one blackboard summary of the proof of one of these conjectures. What about if you read all this upside down? Well, what would that be? You would apply this BV operator here, this con operator. Then you would consider this moduli space. Um, so this moduli space makes sense whenever you're looking at, you know, category of, uh, at a version of symplectic cohomology um, where, you know, the Hamiltonian is sort of zero at infinity. Um, so if you're just looking at Morse theory, this thing makes sense. Um, and so in the proper case, you can make sense of this type of moduli space. And this, so here on the left-hand side, we had exactly, what was it? The turn character of the diagonal and then we had one tensor delta. Here we have one tensor delta, and then we have this pairing. This is the moduli space that defines the pairing on um, uh, cohomology. And uh, here, of course, you can do the same argument. This moduli space can be degenerated into a union of disks, and we have this con operator here. And then for exactly the same reason, this is equal to zero. So sort of if you wanted to think about what's going on from the TQFT perspective, if you allow this degeneration, these conjectures are true, um, and these degenerations exist in the relevant geometric context in symplectic geometry. Um, so let me briefly speculate about how to think about what's going on. I think this is sort of very nice. These two conjectures, they look kind of complicated, but they have very simple TQFT interpretations in the end, and you can think of them as admitting geometrically dual proofs. Um, so I was very confused by this because um, while the subject is confusing, there's all these operads and all these different technicalities, um, but sort of there's this framed E2 operad, which I mentioned, and then there are these two different kinds of circles. So one of them is the circle given by rotating this dot. And then if you degenerate that, so if you allow that to die, this circle by rotating this dot, this lot lives inside the framed E2 operad. And if you kill it, then you get the Grimm of Witten operad. Um, you get the operad given by the moduli spaces of stable maps of genus zero. But there's this other S1, and apparently what happens is that this S1 dies in symplectic, in the sum operad which acts on symplectic cohomology. 
I was very, I kept, you know, asking people, what is this operad? Like, what should this mean algebraically? But you see that there are two outputs here. So it's not one, there's two outputs. So this kind of picture, it can never lie in any operad, but it could lie in a prop. So. So a prop is like a, an operat with multiple outputs, essentially, I mean, to, with then sort of interesting horizontal compositions. So um, I think that, you know, maybe the way one should think about this is that there's this framed E2 prop, and this thing has S1B in it, the second S1. And then if you kill that, you should get some kind of prop which should act on symplectic cohomology where you're allowing for certain degenerations like this kind of degeneration but not this kind of degeneration of, of this first type okay and then this thing inside here has s1a and maybe if you kill that you're going to get a grimmel witten prop So this is this is the speculative part, um, and so somehow you know this, these conjectures are like um, coming from this sort of TQFT picture maybe, but it's just a bit of a misleading picture. There's these different types. There's these essentially different types of degenerations, and one does not imply the other in general. Um, so I don't know what this prop should be. Maybe it should be something like if you have inputs and outputs. You're allowed nodal um, degenerations, but not ones which separate all the inputs from the outputs. And one reason, oh, that was a bad picture. There we go. And uh, so, you know, in Fleur homology, you have to put in some weights on the top and some weights on the bottom. The weights on the bottom have to be bigger than the weights on the top. You need the subclose one form. That's the kind of thing you can do if you, know, you don't separate the top from the bottom and the sum of the weights on the top is smaller than the sum of the weights on the bottom. The outputs go down. Um, so I don't know what this should be. So this kind of thing should be allowed, but like this kind of thing should not be allowed. Um, so maybe you should call this the pressure prop. I don't know. I'm not sure if it has a name. Um, the idea is somehow if water flows down, then maybe Sullivan named this prop. I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, so I think uh, Josh, oh, Demuk, one Thank of you. Mohammed's younger students, has been thinking about what is this prop and how to define it, um, and whether this can really sort of whether the existence of these, the truth of these conjectures in a category implies an action of this prop, and so on. And maybe it has some application to like, you know, the grimmel witten invariance of just a smooth category instead of a smooth and proper one. Um, that's so. I, I think I'll end there and take questions. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's thank uh, Simone. Okay, Zheng Yi Zhao raised the hand. Uh, I don't see that raised hand, but there was a someone was just about to say something. Was that was that uh, was that Muhammad? Yes, yes. I wanted him to actually mention the student's name rather than say some student. No, I did. Yash Demuk. I hope I wrote this right. He's probably in the thing, in the in the in this chat, so you guys can ask him after in the discussion. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, great. So, other other questions for our speaker? Um, I wanted to know more about these uh, two different circles that you're generating in this prop. Okay. okay. I'm not sure I can tell you anything super substantial but i can try to talk about it yes i mean you might have to talk to yash i think he's been th he's thought about this a lot more than i have but um so do you expect there's only to be only two different types of circles or could i is it, should there be more yeah i don't see why there would be more but i have not actually you know proven this these these statements about push outs of props um is just sort of indicates that this is this would be an explanation of what this TQFT argument is about. 
Maybe just a comment in addition to a question uh, from me. I uh, perhaps just want to say these aren't completely unrelated circles, of course. Like I can glue, you know, so so I, I can think of one of them as a straight up and down cylinder, and one of them is sort of a macaroni pointed down. I can realize, you know, <clears throat> um, I can one one explanation of the fact that the right one degenerates and the left one doesn't is that the left S1 only degenerates after I glue it to the right one. So, I mean, I can think of the right degeneration in terms of gluing on a left thing and allowing it to degenerate. I mean, all That's I want right. to say is but the S1 actions aren't- you need to allow for this kind, of fit, this kind of cap, right? That's right. <clears throat> yeah, all, all I want to say is they're, they're not unrelated S1s. Yeah, they're not unrelated. So you might imagine in the proper case, sort of, if you have a degeneration of the S1 action, maybe that does imply these conjectures. I'm not, um, I haven't you know, worked out all the possibilities here. Um, you know, these conjectures of Kinsevich's are true whenever, for, you know, the smooth one is true whenever your category admits a categorical compactification. So if it, you can realize it as a localization of a smooth and proper category by a full subcategory, um, which is sort of, I think, an interesting fact. Um, I don't know if there's a TQFT proof of that, but there very well might be. Tim has a question. Thanks. Tim, yeah. Yeah, I, I just typed it in the chat. Um, you proved your theorem in the proper case when you mm -hmm. took the Fukaya category of closed exact Lagrangians. I was just wondering if you could extend this to, you know, certain partially wrapped categories. Which yeah, I think whenever there, you've sort of fully stopped the wrapping, the an yeah. identical argument proves this. Okay. I also think there's more. So this is all in the exact sense, in the exact setting. Um, you probably expect, you know, ex working in the exact setting to not be relevant. So if you study the degenerations of the, these, uh, in the proper case, if there's this moduli space of annuli, and if you study the, the degenerations in the, um, uh, in the non-exact case, there's one more type of degeneration which could happen, which might screw up the argument, which is uh, disk bubbles with no inputs. Mm -hmm. But I think if you take those into account, then what you'll get is that if you look at the uncurved version of your curved A infinity category, then that thing satisfies this condition. Okay. Um, but, you know, that involves working with virtual cycles to prove, so I haven't even, it, it didn't seem to be at the heart of the, the project. So then you have to work with, what's in this, uh, in the rap, you know, in the proper, the proper conjecture in the, open case, you just have to work with the appropriate version of symplectic homology, symplectic homology, the sector, I guess. I have another question as well, but if someone else has a question, they should, they should ask. Go ahead. I, I think we don't, um, I, I think we don't have another question currently. So go okay. ahead, please. Yeah, I was also wondering um, how important is the assumption that C1 equals zero? Yeah, um, so I don't think it's important. Uh, uh -huh. I think I wrote this, uh, I think this uh, whole diagram um, that I wrote uh, makes sense even if C1 is not equal to zero. Mm -hmm. I think I, I just wrote the, you know, I got, when, I, when I wrote my slides, I confused Hochschild homology and homology in the expos expository section. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask uh, just a, a simple question? Uh, mm -hmm. Ezra Getzler here. Um, so I had thought that Kaledin's uh, theorem had some uh, additional hypotheses on the smooth proper DG category. There are several papers of Kaledin about the subject. Ah, I so finally there are no additional hypotheses. I believe that eventually it was proven with no additional hypotheses. However, as far as I know, there's a natural Z2 graded version of this uh, degeneration con mm -hmm. con conjecture and that's still open. Ah. Hence my question about the importance of C1 being equal to zero. Right, so I mean, you know, when you do Fukaya categories somehow, I mean, every time, if you wanna say a moduli space of things between some indices, you can always just say moduli space of index one. Um, Though for Fukaya categories, the Z mod two graded version of degeneration does hold. Yeah, for example, yeah. by the same argument mm -hmm. as yes. Shields, right. the Shields paper. Um, any other questions? Can I say one thing just makes me, well, this is the comment, not a question. Um, 
I would be just a tiny little bit worried in the Z2 graded with signs. Yes, so maybe, so yeah, because there's left and right categories and stuff, or? Yeah, when the Z2 graded with F2 coefficients, I totally believe it. Yeah. In the Z2 graded case, you know, in the presence of, yeah, with signs, then I would just have to kind of carefully check that there isn't something that, that destroys what's going on. And the reason is, because you do this reversal, yes. This reversal is really annoying in the general case. Yeah, it's like the statement that there is a Calabi-Yau structure, and that's not, how not true. Um, uh, not, not true. There's no, you know, there's... In some situations, you can have a Foucault category which doesn't have a, Z, a Calabi-Yau structure over the... In, even which is defined over the integers, but for which the Calabi-Yau structure doesn't make sense over the integers because there's a twist. Sure. So you're yeah. talking about when the Lagrangians are pin and not spin. Yes, that's right. That that kind of problem. Yes. Yes. So you know, I'm, I'm not saying that it happens here. I'm just saying, can, you know, like, there's an yeah, extra. So I, you know, the, the draft has uh, does not does not have a sign verification. Yeah, so that's I, I understand. So there, right, there are extra assumptions you might want to make in in general. I agree. Mm -hmm. That's all. And I, I think if I write C1 equals zero, the sign verification will most likely work out. Um, that's but, right. Uh, yeah, I'm not worried about C1 equals zero. I'm just. Uh, other questions for our speaker? Uh, Ezra Gessler, I think we are having an informal part. Okay, well, if there are no other questions for the formal period, I think uh, um, we, can, we can stop here and um, let's thank uh, Simone again. All right, thank you everyone for listening.